Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. This is Brenda J. Today, we have Dustin Bailey on the show. Dustin is a regional mental health champion for Celebrate Recovery and has a PhD in general psychology. He also studied forensic psychology, addiction counseling, Christian Studies and Applied Business Management. He was also in the Air Force. Thank you for your service. I listened to Dustin's testimony at Celebrate Recovery, and I love how he passionately uses all he's been through to help others. So welcome to the show, Dustin. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. Continuing with part two. How to heal from it is a whole other experience. For me, healing isn't the absence of symptoms because it's the way I'm designed. I'm going to have these experiences throughout my life, and I'm learning to be okay with that. For me, healing is the reliance on taking care of it or stewarding this life that God's given me and relying on his will for my life to be able to walk out what I'm doing while I have those symptoms. So when I struggle and maybe I, I'm manic and I, I hurt someone's feelings because I'm terse or I'm short or I'm abrasive, um, when I do that, I might not be aware that I've done that. So that might be bipolar doing that. And so I'm not in recovery for bipolar disorder. But when I'm aware that I've hurt somebody and I'm, I'm made aware that, that I might need to reach out to somebody and make an amends and try to make things right as best as I can as far as it depends on me. That's the area where my recovery comes in. That's where my healing happens, Mm -hmm. is the returning back to what God wants me to do in the moments I have the capacity to do it. So that's the long answer to diagnosing, treating, and healing. And I have a couple of questions on that. So you would have to get diagnosed for that. I mean, where would someone go if they are suspecting that? Would they have to go to a psychologist or... There's a lot of different open doors to starting that process. And one of the first things, if you're not comfortable going to a mental health professional, you can see your actual physical doctor and say, hey, I I believe I'm experiencing these types of moods and I'm not sure something's up and I want to know what more is there. Most medical professionals have a basic understanding of some of the psychological or mental health aspects in treatment, and they probably won't be offering you a treatment, but they will be offering you maybe a referral. Yeah. What you can do is go to a counselor or a counseling company, and it depends on maybe if you have insurance, which one is recommended by your insurance, or if you live in a municipality or a certain area, what your local area provides to you. But just reach out to a mental health professional, which is typically a counselor, and they'll go through a process that's called an intake where they'll ask you some questions, they'll find out more about you and what your experiences are, and then they'll get a good idea as to what the next steps are. A psychiatrist is typically the person that prescribes the medication and makes sure that your medicinal part is in line. And they usually come a little later down the road. But psychology, therapy, those are great places to start. And there are some resources that are out there if you need to find one. If you're in crisis right now or if you're a person that's listening and you're really in a state of crisis or in a state of of not knowing if you can continue moving forward and you're really heavy in this experience, I would encourage you just to dial 988 and 988 will get you and connected with somebody that can walk you through a process of telling you what your next steps are. Another resource you can use if you're looking for counseling and you're not sure where to go for it is each community has a thing called community information and referral or something like that, which is a municipality that keeps track of all the different providers in your area. That's a good place to go to be able to find resources where you can find help. You can find a person that can walk you through that. A website you can go to is called SAMHSA.gov, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, S-A-M-H-S-A.gov. And they've got a locator on their site where you can type in your zip code and it'll give you a list of different providers in your area. Now, they may or may not accept insurance. They may or may not accept new clients, but it's a starting point. It's a great place to be able to start asking that question to find that answer. Yeah, that's good information. And I mean, is it, is it something that can come on from like maybe somebody that's gone through like a traumatic event and maybe never treated it? Can they become bipolar? 
you can develop mental health challenges of all kinds based on different events. What it is is a change in your brain chemistry. When you talk about traumatic events, PTSD, CPTSD, those are actual injuries. Those are brain injuries. There's a part of the brain that's been harmed physiologically. And because of that harm, you could also have a change in brain chemistry. And that brain chemistry can then bring around mood disorders such as bipolar. So there's a possibility for that. There's also what we talked about before that comorbidity, those two things happening at the same time, you can very easily have experienced trauma or experienced an event that can trigger this chemical imbalance in your brain, which results in a mood disorder or personality disorder. So the short answer is yes, that could potentially happen. But I would say that you definitely want to talk to somebody and walk through what that looks like, because the way that you approach them is different. And being able to have a different approach for everything else, just like if you were to go to your physician and you were to say, hey, look, I'm sneezing a lot and I'm also got this rash on my skin. It could be allergies and you're breaking out. It could be anaphylaxis. There could be a bunch of different things going on. But your treatment would probably be something that's a combination of something that helps with the symptom of sneezing and something that helps with the rash. And likewise, when you're getting into mental health treatment, it's the same thing. There's a different treatment approach for each of the different experiences that you're having. You want to make sure that you can bring on healthy approaches to handle whatever you're experiencing. Yeah, I have one more quick question. Sure. To argue with this. I know some friends that are going through some things right now, so I'm curious about this. So what if someone you suspect as someone is going through this, but they don't see it? Do you have any advice for like the loved ones around them that might be able to help? I do. I want to first off tell you that there's a a caution to this. You want to make sure that when you're reaching out to somebody that you think might be going through this, that you're doing it from a position of love and a position of care. I know that there's an, an element of concern when, especially when it's a loved one, and that concern can sometimes become anxious concern. It can sometimes motivate you to see things as you want to correct something for them or make sure that they're getting their help. But ultimately, the only way that people can receive help is if they seek it. Mm -hmm. And so what you've got to do is have a conversation that's based in concern and based in love. Mm -hmm. So I have conversations with people that are loved ones, and I've had these in the past. And it always starts off with what I call the love sandwich. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And it's the, the idea of saying something that starts with expressing why you care, which is, you know, I know I want to talk to you about something. It's going to be difficult to talk about, but I want you to know the reason I'm doing that is because I love you very much and I'm concerned about you and I care for you and I want to be here as best as I can. And then from there, you can ask the questions. I've noticed and using kind of a personal perspective, an I, me perspective, mm-hmm. I'm concerned because I've noticed that there are some differences in your behavior and I don't know that they're doing good things for you or that they might not be healthy or that I'm seeing this and it might be putting you at risk. And I'm wondering if you've considered talking to somebody about that and then kind of go through that conversation that way. And then you want to end with the other part of the set love sandwich is the other slice of love bread, so to speak, which is the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I love you, because I care about you, and I want you to be okay. Yeah. So that the person knows that they're kind of covered in love in the process, but you also have a very real conversation in the middle. Mm-hmm. And that conversation has to be from a place of relationship where the person knows that you're doing this because you you care about them. I mean, we wouldn't walk up to somebody that was a stranger on the street and say, you need to go see a, a counselor right now. It wouldn't be received very well. So it's got to be something that's in relationship with a person that already knows that you're vested in them. One of the great bumper stickers that's in recovery that I see all the time is people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Mm. And so that's part of this. And that will be the first step is basically expressing your concern, reaching out to them and and telling them what you're seeing, what you're experiencing, what, what you're observing, and keeping it focused on what you're doing, not necessarily you saying to the other person, you're doing this and you're doing that and you're having this experience and you're doing this. You want to say, I'm seeing this or I'm I'm concerned because I am perceiving this and then asking them what they see so that they can be the expert in their lives and you can keep it focused on what your motives are, what your experiences are. And then hopefully walk them through a conversation where, the, where they're willing to say, hey, look, at the end of it, I'm willing to help you in any way you want. I can come look some stuff up with you or I can just sit here and be with you if you want and we'll get through this together. Yeah, I, I think I overloved sandwich someone because by the time they understood it and then I don't know, then they just seemed to like brush it off. Like, I don't know. It was strange. Anyway, can you overlove sandwich? <laughs> you can have too much bread and not enough peanut butter and jelly. That's true. I've been there. What did I do here? I was like, thinking, oh, okay, I got to have a fine line there. I did more meat and something. <laughs> that's it. And it's, and that's sometimes that's the hard part for, for a lot of folks. For me and some of the earlier conversations, especially when I was struggling through codependency, 
I really wanted people to like me. I also didn't want to hurt their opinion or their feelings. And so I would kind of gloss over things. And I learned eventually that the best way that I can love somebody is to have that matter of fact part in the middle, which is really hard to do for me, but I've gotten better at it over the course of time. Yeah. When you realize you're doing it, like you said, it's out of love. It's, you know, it's a motive of love that it's easier to communicate that. Yeah. All right. So we kind of covered this a little bit, but so this is important to me. I know when you gave your testimony, you talked about how you were in an abusive family growing up, right? Yeah. Abuse going on. This is a podcast to help people heal from abuse as well. So can your mental health become worse if you are abused or come from an abusive childhood family? Absolutely. I think that's one of those givens. There's very few things statistically that are at 100% in this world. But one of the statistics is that 100% of people that are survivors of abuse or in current abusive situations are experiencing some form of mental health challenge. It's 100%. Now, the severity, the prevalence, severity being how severe is it, how how large is it uh, weighing in your life, the prevalence, how widespread is it, and how long is it lasting in your life, all of those can be variables that can be higher or lower. But if you're in an abusive situation where you're the victim of abuse currently or in the past, you've received trauma and that trauma will manifest itself in ways that will affect your mental health and cause mental health challenges. Now, those things can be seasonal as well. And triggers are a great way of experiencing those. I know the a lot of folks that have experienced and expressed uh, PTSD, a lot of times your day is going swimmingly. You're having an excellent day. Life is going along. You feel like you're bobbing pretty good and, and it's, it's a good vibe. And all of a sudden something will pop up and it will be a trigger. And when that trigger hits, you start to experience everything that comes along with PTSD. You start to experience anxiety. You start to experience fear. You start to ex- have some of those same fight, flight, freeze responses that come through that aren't necessarily a part of the environment you're in. They're not a normal response to that environment, but because it's a learned response, something in your brain has said, hey, you have to react this way. And this can happen after you've been in treatment for a long time for PTSD, or for if you've been recovering from being a victim of abuse in past or present. So this is something that anybody that's been to this rodeo has seen, so to speak. And it's one of those things that you have to have a lot of patience for yourself and you have to have a lot of grace for yourself too. When you have that experience, it doesn't mean that the work you've done in the past is not valid anymore. In fact, it's probably just as valid or more so because you're actually recognizing in real time what you're experiencing. But I would say that there are certain defense mechanisms that people build inside to be able to live through abuse. And when you experience those defense mechanisms, they can become unhealthy coping mechanisms that then change the way that you address the rest of the world in in any given moment, which can sometimes, for me, hypervigilance, hyper-anxiety, overanalytics. Those are things that were go-tos for me because it was important for my survival that I immediately read rooms, recognize dangers, and I'm the smartest person in that area, so I know where the first exit's at. And that was how I survived, and that cascaded into how my anxiety and mania manifests itself in my mental health challenges. So I would say yes. Yeah, I think that's really true. I'm actually taking a course right now where it kind of talks about that, about understanding your coping mechanisms that, you know, they may, they had a place at the time when you're a child or whatever to protect you, but then they're not helpful now, but you're so used to, you know, they're like your standbys, you don't realize that they're hurting you. Yeah. I've done all these things to heal and just did like another round of EMDR. Mm -hmm. I realized I did all the healing and I have these great relationships with women and friends and church, but the thought, I thought I was healing and like maybe ready to, but the thought of a man just, it trigger is a trigger, like of even being in a relationship still to this point. So everything else is is great. Then I'm like, uh, no, (laughs) I think it's ongoing, the healing. It's just different, you know, different areas that it gets focused on at the time. Yeah, and so I, I agree with yeah. I agree when you're abused. My point was, I agree when you're abused, you struggle with, and even when you think you're doing better, then like your day goes by, and the next thing you know, you realize you have this other challenge. Yeah, that you're like, oh, I'm struggling with this now. But I mean, if you think about what you've been through, mm-hmm. you can give yourself compassion to say, well, you know, my body's just trying to protect itself, yeah. you know. And then he just said, just recognizing it alone, that's yeah, more than you did before, right? Because I didn't have a getting better is this. Yeah, Yeah. it's this process. It's this progression that you have. I know that one of my friends, she's working through uh, CPTSD through a traumatic abuse starting early in childhood and going through her adult life. And it's focused on primary abusers were all men. And so very much like what you're experiencing. And one of the things that was an aha moment for her, when she's been going through this process of learning and, and growing and at the same time struggling, but the aha moment for her was she said there's been this shift where she went from saying, 
some men are good to some men are bad. And I didn't dawn on me originally when I thought through that. But that was the assumption that the vast majority of the men in the world are bad, but only some are good and safe. And then through her process, she's come to a place where the vast majority of men that she experiences are neutral and some of them are bad. And she still has to be careful and cognizant of that, too. And her frustration was that she still sees some total strangers as being uh, these triggering individuals in her life regardless of not knowing their motivations. And my encouragement for her was that she's grown by leaps and bounds from being from a place where she couldn't be around men at all to a place where some of those men are harmful, but the vast majority of them are neutral. Mm -hmm. And that's been a lot of work in her life to get there. I guess I have come a long way then. Yeah. Because I was at the point where I couldn't be around any, and now it's like slowly letting <laughs> one or two in, Yeah, still being freaked out half the time, but yeah. Okay, so are there any other mental health conditions you've been seeing that we haven't mentioned on this podcast? Well, we focused a lot on mood disorders because that's my particular walk that I'm going through I'm with bipolar, and a lot of my family also struggles with mood disorders, but there are personality disorders that are out there, a borderline personality disorder, BPD is one of those. There are people that are experiencing schizoaffective disorder or they're having what are called psychotic episodes. Now, what I, I want to do is I want to clarify what that means. A lot of people, when they hear of a psychotic episode, they get very nervous or afraid for themselves because another person might be experiencing that. But all of it means is that the person that is having that episode is experiencing the reality that they're in differently than the one that you can observe. They're experiencing something with their senses that you can't experience with your senses. They're hearing, seeing, tasting, smelling, feeling something that their mind is telling them is existing there and where yours isn't. And that doesn't put you in much danger. It might put them in some danger, but it doesn't put you in much danger. A lot of people will associate mental health challenges or mental health diagnosis and be afraid of people because they're afraid that these are people that are going to harm them. But the reality is only 4% of all violent interactions that have from through hospitalizations or through police interactions, only 4% of those are from people that have experienced mental health challenges that are diagnosable. But at the same time, 26% of all people with those mental health challenges that are diagnosable will be victims of violence or victims of crime. So it's a, a way of thinking that's got to change a little bit, that this isn't necessarily the perpetrator of a wrong. More likely, it's going to be the victim of a wrong is a person that's experiencing a mental health challenge. So when I say things like a person that's having a schizoaffective disorder or having a psychotic episode, uh, personality disorders, there are several of those that people have experienced. There's also something called neurodivergency, which is an experience saying that your neurology is experiencing, uh, your brain is experiencing life in a way that is either over or under stimulating at a neurological level. Sometimes folks will have a neurodivergent experiences when they get over sensitized by or overstimulated by sensory inputs. Uh, too many people, bright lights, a lot of noise, and it causes a physical reaction from that. One of the ways that we are starting to see that more and more in the church and also in celebrate recovery is making space and making room for folks that are experiencing neurodivergency. And one of those ways is something as simple as providing fidgets, providing small toys or tools that they can use that they can manipulate with their hands that help them self-soothe or help them self-stimulate in those environments. So it's levels of neurodivergency. There's levels of not just mood disorders, but personality disorders. We talked a lot about PTSD and CPTSD, but there's also elements that are also physiological or physical injury that comes to the brain that's there as well. So there's a whole host of different uh, mental health challenges that people are experiencing. And if I didn't name yours, I know that there are a ton out there. What I'm glad as far as a trend is that we are actually seeing them. What that means is I'm actually able to have a conversation with a person who's willing to talk about it. People that have mental health challenges oftentimes, or people with neurodivergency, they spend a lot of their life effort and energy trying to adapt their behavior so that the rest of the world can accept them on the world's terms. So I will spend so much of my energy in life trying to behave in such a way that the normal people will see me as normal. And in the process, it will be exhausting to me to become functioning. And the reality is we're starting to see people that are able to be who they are and have the experiences they're having without having to try to mask their behaviors or spend their energy to normalize for other people. So we're actually able to see them for who they are. And that's encouraging for me. You know, that's yeah, positive. definitely. It's a positive thing. And I mean, it is true because we did that podcast on the dynamics of abuse with Bob Hamp and one on codependency. And, you know, abuse victims, like you just said, 100% of us end up with some type of mental health issue. But he says that 
abuse victims are kind, giving, long suffering. Like, yeah. so I get exactly what you're saying, like what your point was before, because we're so afraid of that term, mental health mm. and whatever with mental health condition. Yeah. We're so worried about and we have fear associated with it. But at the same time, like you're saying, they end up being victims. Mm. Right. That's yeah. And then better understand, understand, yeah, understanding that these the folks that are struggling with mental health challenges are all of us that yeah, we right. all have the mental health. Yeah. And we'll all go through a season where we'll have a challenge being able to balance that and that everyone's mental health is their own unique personal experience with health. And those challenges are very real, regardless of the levels and severities of them. A lot of what I learned about human behavior and a lot of what I learned about how my relationship with God also comes from my toddlers when I, when they were little, learning from them. I've had to take toys away from my toddler and put them on top of the refrigerator. And I've watched my toddler just melt down, just cry like it is the absolute end of the world. And it's so easy as an adult for me to think, well, this is no big deal. Why are you losing it over such a small thing as a toy? And lose sight of the fact that for this toddler, for this child, this is a very big deal. It's the same as me losing my job or losing maybe even a loved one. This is something that's very important that's been suddenly taken away and it causes a, a serious emotional response. And when we stop comparing those pieces and stop trying to put everybody on a scale and we just realize that pain is pain and that challenges are challenges and that we all are going to experience those in a very real and personal way, my experience is just as deep for me as yours is for you. Then we start to realize that there's really nothing to be really worried about or afraid of and that we all are on this road together. That's good. Yeah, I was like, I was at a concert the other day and the lead singer was really sharing about his struggle with mental health. And I, I love when I hear people being honest and sharing that because I think it helps every, everyone else go, yeah, okay, I'm not the only one that struggles with It does, just struggles sitting here talking to you right now is making me look at it in a whole different perspective. Yeah. We all struggle. Yeah, we all struggle we all in different struggle. ways and go through different cycles. So what advice would you give to someone struggling with mental health? Don't struggle alone. You have people in your life that love you and that care about you, and they may do it in imperfect ways. But one of the biggest things that happens, and one of the biggest challenges for people finding health and healing in mental uh, health challenges is that they simply keep it to themselves, bottle it up and try to move on without it. Or they don't share it with someone else because they're afraid the other person won't understand or won't accept them or will see them differently. Sometimes maybe they don't feel like they're worthy of, of being able to reach out to someone else and, and receive help. But my first encouragement, my first piece of advice is don't struggle alone because you're not alone. There's people around you that love you. If you can't find a person in your mind right now that loves you, I would encourage you to go to CelebrateRecovery.com. Look yeah. in the top right corner for the locator and find a meeting next to you. You will instantly be introduced with a room full of people, many of which will love you. They haven't met you yet, but they still love you. Yeah, and they're willing to walk was, alongside you. That is one of the most loving places I've ever gone into is yeah. at Impact Celebrate Recovery. There's You just feel feel the love. It's amazing. Yeah, it's just you're so, everyone's so real. Mm -hmm. There's no pretenses or anything. Yeah. But that's it. Finding that, finding that first person that you can walk alongside with. That's important. One of my favorite verses in the Bible comes out of the book of Job. And for folks that don't know the story of Job, Job lost everything in his entire world in the world's worst run on sins. Basically, a guy comes in and tells him, Hey, all of your crops are being burned. And while he was still speaking, a guy comes in and says, Hey, look, all your stuff has been stolen. And while he was still speaking, a guy comes in and says, Hey, all of your children have died. And while he was still speaking means he got all of this news about him losing everything in the span of like four minutes. And so his whole world shuts down. And because in the Bible, people wanted their outsides to look like their insides felt, he tore his clothes and he covered himself in, in ashes and wore sackcloth and his body was also covered in sores. And he was just sitting out in, in the dirt and his friends heard the, about the problems he was having. And so they came from far away to see what they could do. And one of the most beautiful verses in the Bible in Job 2, 13, is when his friends finally get there and they see him from a distance and they could barely recognize him. So they sat in the dirt with him and no one spoke a word for seven days, seven nights, because his grief was so great. The value of just being there with someone. I can't express how important that is, how reassuring it is just to not be alone. So be there with someone. Someone will be there with you. The next thing I would say is be willing to make a difference in your life. It's going to be scary that you might have to make some changes. You might have to tell someone your story. You might have to go somewhere and see a person that's that's trained to help you. And that might be scary, but it's okay. 
because just like I'm terrified of the dentist, but every time I leave, I know that I'm in a better shape than when I went. Mm-hmm. It's still okay to go talk to somebody that can help with, with the mental health side of it too. So find that person first that's going to be there with you and don't suffer alone. Don't isolate. Secondly, seek the help that's there because you're valuable and God sees the value in you and you're worth it. And then the third thing is just keep trying. Every small victory, even when there's setbacks, the small victories are going to be there. Even if the setbacks push you back a little bit, moving forward is going to keep you moving forward. It's life is this inch by the inch. It's mm-hmm. hard by the yard. So mm-hmm. moving forward ever so slowly is still progress towards health and you're trending in the right way. It may not be all better now and 100% when you first start, if you want it to be, it might take a long time, but you're going to have people alongside you because you did that first. And you're going to have people that are helping you figure out what to do next because you did that second. So just keep at it and keep reassuring yourself that any small victory is still a victory in the right direction. So that would be my advice. I like what you said about you don't have to say anything. I think that's really important because I think we think or, you know, we expect that someone's going to want all this advice or we have to have have some wisdom and really just to sit with someone, you know, like weep with them, maybe you have to or whatever, but just you don't have to have answers. In fact, usually they don't want answers that, that that can add to the depression and everything. So I like what you said about just being present with someone yeah, you know, that's, that's in pain. You know, you don't have to say anything or have all this advice. How One you- of the things I've noticed about that is when people will try to help, a lot of times they're not helping because they want the other person to feel better. They're helping because they don't like how they feel right. when the other person doesn't feel good. Mm, and yeah. so you're trying to make a joke or minimize or at least somebody, you know, but what I mean by that was like someone we hurting and you say, well, at least you've got this, or at least it's not as bad as that. Yeah. Or do some kind of behavior to change them, not necessarily for the person to feel better, but so that I don't feel bad about you feeling bad. Yeah. And that's an awful lot of responsibility to put on a person that's already struggling to be responsible for my feelings as well as theirs. So it's it's really hard to do that. One of the things that I like about that is I'm reminded of the story of the Apple Store. If you go to the Apple Store because you can't you can't open your contacts, you you got your phone and the contacts won't open. So you go to the Apple Store and they're taught to put their hands in their pocket and never touch your phone. They'll walk you through it and they'll talk you through it, but they won't just take their phone. Now, they work at the Apple Store, so they could take your phone and in two seconds go button, button, button. Here you go. It works. And they could walk and you walk out and the person would walk out and they'd have their contacts. And that sounds good. But the problem isn't that they can't open their contacts. The problem is they can't navigate their phone. They don't feel comfortable on their phone. So instead, you help a person learn to navigate their phone, which would include opening their contacts, but they learn to do it themselves. And what ends up happening is now I feel like I've learned something. I've gotten better myself. It doesn't feel as good to the person that's helping. There's no attaboy in the back because you're not saving. You're just helping. But the other person gets a lifetime's worth of help in that process. And so just simply being there and sitting in the dirt, not having any magic words to say and not fixing anybody, but just being present and letting them feel what they feel, that's going to help them find their healing fastest. Yeah, that's very good advice. Because I know there's times when I think when I get the downness, I, that's what I want is I just want someone to sit with me and not. I agree. I mean, I have two friends going through illness right now and I don't know how they feel and I don't know what to say. So I just am there to support them yeah. and not say anything. Yeah, that's all we can do. I don't know what to say. Right. Yeah. So we thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, Where can our listeners find you on social media or to reach out for help? Well, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciated this. One of the places I would direct people on social media is if they're a Facebook user, they can go to CRMHMI, which is Celebrate Recovery Mental Health Ministry International, or CRMHMI. And that's the Celebrate Recovery Mental Health Ministry page on Facebook. It's a public page that's open that you can find other folks that are going to give you encouragement. You can ask questions. There are people that can be able to help you find uh, resources for help and support. That's probably the very best way to find me on social media. And it's just not only myself, but it's other regional mental health champions that work with folks uh, all the time, as well as people that are just plugged into the mental health ministry, mental health champions from all over the world that want to help. Yeah, that's awesome. Because I didn't realize that Celebrate Recovery had so much support for mental health. And we try to find people with our nonprofit and podcast help with free resources for healing. And so this is great. I just appreciate this so much. It's just, it's incredible. Yeah, Yeah, that was, it was a really, that. that was really, really good. I just felt God's presence. Mm hmm. 
It's really nice to meet you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks uh, again. Like this is this has been awesome. I needed to hear a lot of it myself because like I'm in a season right now where I'm I'm working on some a publication I'm putting together and um poor me all day long. <laughs> like, oh no, this is so bad for me. And then then I'm being able to tell my story, then I can remember what really bad kind of truly looks like from perspective. Yeah. And then talking to other people about hope kind of gives a little bit of hope too. So I really appreciate it. Yeah. And you can listen back to this as much as you want and heal from it. We, I, we've healed from, we have how many, I don't know if you looked at our material, but we've got a lot of podcasts and yeah, it's it's, I've healed so much. Like compared to what I was at the beginning on, on my first podcast, I would, that was like two and a half years ago. I was so broken. So, 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 so like <laughs> that was just the beginning and yours, you know, we're like different people yeah, now. So I, know, I cringe when I hear my, my, my no. <laughs> God has used it. So hopefully you'll get a chance to listen and thank you so much again. Have a great night. You too. Yeah. Thanks. You too. Bye. Thanks for tuning in to Hanging on to Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there, and if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening, and until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you, and our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone.